The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Hear us, O Lord, when we call. O Lord God of hosts, turn us back again. O Lord, hear the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But with thee there is forgiveness, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Amen. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. O Lord, Today we are reading the last of your letters to the seven churches. We pray that we may have ears to hear what thy Holy Spirit says to the churches, that by thy word we may overcome our weaknesses and receive the heavenly rewards that thou hast promised. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Keep us in thy name, O Lord, Thank you. Glory be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. Praise the Lord. Recitation is number 75. It comes from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8. A voice says, Proclaim. And I said, What shall I proclaim? All flesh is grass, and all its holiness is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. For the spirit of Yehovah blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God shall rise up to eternity. Families with young children are welcome to come forward now.
children, I'm going to read the Lord's letter to the church in a town called Laodicea. Now see if you can tell what the Lord thinks of the people of the church of Laodicea. Are they good people or not so good? And especially, are these people rich or poor? See if you can tell from what the Lord says. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the handwork of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Would that thou wert cold or hot. Therefore, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and enriched and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold fired in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white garments that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness not be manifested and anoint thine eyes with eye salve so that thou mayest see as many as I love I reprove and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will have supper with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give to sit with me on my throne, as I overcame, and sit with the Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so do you think that the people of the church of Laodicea are rich or poor? What do you think the Lord said about that? What do you guess? Poor? Is that what you were going to say too? Is that what you were going to say too? Yeah? Yes? So, children, the Lord, you were right that the Lord says that they are poor. He says, you say that you are rich, and I don't need anything. But actually, you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And the Lord tells them what they should do. He says, buy from me real gold tested in the fire so that you can be really rich and buy from me beautiful white clothes so that you can be clothed. Now, what is the Lord saying to us in his letter to the church of Laodicea? In the spiritual sense, people who think that they're rich, but actually they're poor, are people who know a lot of things from the Lord's word. Like they can say lots of recitations pretty well, and they can talk about the Lord, and they can talk about heaven, but they don't really do what the Lord says. They're kind of wishy-washy people, because they kind of believe in the Lord, and they like to talk about the Lord in heaven, but they don't actually do what the Lord says. The Lord told us a parable about people like this. He said, once a man had two sons, and he said to his first son, son, Go into my vineyard and work for me today. And the son said, no, I won't. But then he felt sorry about that, and he went and worked in his father's vineyard. And the father came to the second son and said, son, go and work for me in my vineyard today. And the second son said, yes, sir, I'm going. But he didn't go. And then the Lord asked, which of the two sons actually did what the father wanted? Yes? The first son. The first son. Yep, the first and, son. And, uh, yes, he did what the Lord wanted him to. Now, so we can think about this. We can sometimes be like the second son where we know a lot of things, but we don't actually do them. And then we're not rich, we're poor. But the Lord tells us what to do. He says, buy from me real gold. Now let me show you 
two pieces in this box here. And you can see that one of them is real gold and one of them is fake gold. And maybe you can guess which one is which and which one, if you had to choose, which one you would prefer to see. Oh, don't, don't touch, please, sweetie. Which one do you think might be the real gold? Now, actually, this one is fake. This is just a rock. Can you see that it's just a rock and it's been spray painted with gold? It looks pretty on the top, but it's really just a rock. It's not worth very much. It's just a rock that's been spray painted, but this is real gold. It's littler. Can I see it? Yes, uh huh. Okay. You can see it. And this is heavy. If you could feel it in your hand, you would feel how heavy it is because it's real gold. Can you see? Now, do you know what gold corresponds to? What does gold correspond to? You can kind of tell by the beautiful color of it. What does gold correspond to? Yes? Love. Love. Love to the Lord because it's a wonderful warm color like the sun. And love is warm. So how do, the, how do we buy from the Lord real gold? It is by doing the Lord's commandments. The Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how you'll really love me. That's how we get real gold. And that's how the Lord also gives us beautiful white garments to put on. White garments are the truths that we know how to recite. We know how to talk about. Well, when we do those truths, it's like we're wrapping ourselves up and wearing those truths. They become our favorite clothes that we wear every day. And then when the Lord calls us to the wedding supper in heaven, we have beautiful wedding clothes already on because we've lived by what the Lord teaches us. And the Lord gives us eye salve or eye medicine for our eyes so we can really see what's right and wrong. We can see the Lord. So the Lord says, be zealous and repent. That means be eager to actually do what the Lord says. And when you don't, repent. Be sorry for it like the first son was sorry. And go ahead and do what the Lord says. In that way, the Lord can invite us to come sit with him on his throne. You can come sit with me on my throne. And he'll give us real gold and beautiful white garments. Amen. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Amen.
Our second lesson is from Apocalypse Revealed, number 200, part of the explanation of the Lord's letter to Laodicea. The beginning of the handwork of God signifies the Word. The divine truth itself in the Word is meant by the Word which was in the beginning with God and which was God but not the word regarded as to the words and letters of the languages in which it is written, but regarded in its essence and life. From the inmost, this essence and life is in the senses or meanings of its words and letters. From this life, the word gives life to the affections of the will of the man who reads it as holy. And from the light of that life, it enlightens the thoughts of his understanding. Therefore, it is said in John, in the word was life, and the life was the light of men. This constitutes the word, because the word is from the Lord, and about the Lord, and thus it is the Lord. All thought, speech, and writing derives its essence and life from him who thinks, speaks, and writes. The man with his quality is in them, but the Lord alone is in the word. No one, however, feels and perceives the divine life in the word, but he who is in the spiritual affection of truth when he reads it. For he is in conjunction with the Lord through the word. There is something intimately affecting the heart and spirit, which flows with light into the understanding and bears witness. In short, without the divine truth of the word, which in its essence is the divine good of the Lord's divine love and the divine truth of his divine wisdom, man cannot have life. By the word, there is the conjunction of the Lord with man and of man with the Lord. And by that conjunction, there is life. There must be something from the Lord that can be received by man, by which there can be conjunction and thence eternal life. From these things it may appear that the beginning of the handwork of God means the word. Blessed is he who reads and they who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Amen.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be for good pleasure in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the handwork of God. Of all the seven churches, the Laodiceans seem to have the greatest difficulty becoming true Christians. Some of these people inspire spiritual vomiting by their vacillation between good and evil. Yet the Lord sees that some of them can become steadfast, strong Christians with repentance. In his mercy, he calls them to the new church. He stands at the door and knocks, urging them to let him come into their lives. The challenge to Laodicea and to all of us is to be zealous to guide our lives by the word and not be wishy-washy, lukewarm Christians. The Laodiceans are people who sometimes form their opinions from themselves, while at other times they believe in the Word. When they are with church friends, they believe in God and eternal life. They believe the Word is true, but privately they're not entirely convinced. They are led astray by popular worldly opinions, or they focus only on getting along in the world, so they don't really care what's true. To these states, the Lord speaks as the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Amen means truth in Hebrew. The Lord used this word over and over again in his teaching. Amen, Amen, I say to you, translated verily, verily, or truly, truly. The Lord is the only witness to the life after death. Here, it is as though the Lord is saying, you can trust my word. I am a reliable, trustworthy witness. But people wonder, how can I know that the Bible really is the Lord's word, not just a superstitious human composition? To a skeptic, it seems primitive, unscientific, and unreliable, full of miracles, archaic laws and customs, even crude and violent parts. If someone cares only about his reputation and status, even though he might become an expert in the Bible, he will never see what is really there. People take similar attitudes toward the heavenly doctrine, the word of the Lord's second coming. The Lord has created us in a wonderful way so that we can discover and see the truth as if by ourselves. We can figure out what makes sense and then act on it. We can read the word, decide what it means to us, and then do it as we see fit. The truth that we see in our conscience becomes our own principles and values. This is the way I see it. This is the way I want to live. So we judge, as from ourselves, whether or not the Bible is the Lord's word authoritative in our lives. At the same time, all truth is the Lord's, including the truths that we hold as our own. The Lord is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He provides us with truths that we can grasp and use. When we take certain of his truths to heart and live them, we are opening the doors of our heart and mind to the Lord and inviting him in. The writings say, there has to be something from the Lord that can be received by man, by which there can be conjunction between the Lord and the man, and so eternal life. That something from the Lord which we can receive is the word. The Lord calls his word, the beginning of the handwork of God, as in John, in the beginning was the word, and all things were made by him. This word doesn't mean the letters, words, and languages of the Bible, but the essence and life contained in the meanings of the words and letters. 
The Lord's infinite love and wisdom are within his word. His love gives spiritual life to the person who reads it reverently with an open mind. Through his word, to the extent that we are willing, the Lord inspires us to love what is honorable, fair, clean, kind, and true. When we love these things, we love the Lord himself, the source of them. In this way, the word is the beginning of, the, of God's handwork, creating us into truly human beings. So the Lord says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. No one notices the divine life within the Bible unless he is in a spiritual, unselfish affection for the truth while reading. But if we realize that we ourselves are not gods, we are not sources of truth and right, but we are people who can receive the truth from the Lord. And if we read the word with a desire to live a useful life with his guidance, then we will receive spiritual life and light while we read. Sometimes, the writings say, we will even notice the Lord's life in the Word affecting us. We read, there is something inmostly affecting the heart and spirit, which flows in with light into his understanding and bears witness. Bears witness to the holiness and truth of the Word. To a person in this state, it becomes perfectly clear that there is a God and a life after death. As he progresses in regeneration, Many other things become equally clear. They become matters of conscience for him from the word. The Lord has given us the heavenly doctrine to uncover the holiness in the word. We read, lest people should be in doubt that the word is holy and divine, the Lord has revealed its internal meaning. This internal sense is the spirit which gives life to the letter. And it can therefore convince even the worldly person if he is willing to be convinced. The Laodicean state includes people who are willing to be convinced. They are not entirely cold to religion or they could not be called to the new church. But neither are they hot or keen to learn and live from the word. This lukewarm, in-between state is very dangerous because they are mixing holy and innocent attitudes with profane ones. They have thought a lot about God and life after death and decided they believe in them. But other times, they let their thoughts focus only on improving their status in this world. So they let themselves sink down into selfishness. In this way, we read, hell swallows them up. Now, this is not a state of occasional failures or of serious evils which a person truly repents of and does not do again. It is not a person who has sowed wild oats as a young adult before he or she had seriously made the church his own. This is a state of prolonged vacillation between believing in the Lord and not really believing. A characteristic of this state is self-satisfaction in one's intelligence. The Lord says, you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. With the heavenly doctrine, we have the opportunity to be very rich spiritually in all the wonderful truths of heaven. But if we don't use our knowledge and take it seriously, then we will become spiritually wretched. And worst of all, we won't know it. Wretched refers to how incoherent a person's thoughts are in this state, sometimes believing, sometimes not, building his spiritual life with one hand and demolishing it with the other. Being miserable and poor means not knowing what is true and good since this knowledge is not well planted in life. Laodiceans are blind because they see the truth only in the company of others, not inside themselves. 
They have no awareness of their own tendencies to evil, so they have made no efforts to cover their spiritual nakedness by repentance. But the cure is straightforward. Take the word seriously and apply it to your life. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. We receive true love, spiritual gold from the Lord as we apply the word to our lives. We become rich in states of love for others, innocence toward the Lord, peace and contentment, and useful practical insights into the uses of our life, all the states that make a person truly happy. The Lord offers us white garments, so our nakedness need not appear. Genuine truths applied to correct our attitudes and habits allow the Lord to cover those evils so they no longer hurt anyone, neither ourselves nor others. Lastly, the Lord advises anointing our eyes with salve to heal our minds from pursuing fantasies and to see how things really are. All of us tend to deny our faults and close our eyes to them, but as soon as we are ready to face them, the Lord offers healing in his word. The Lord always loves us, no matter what state we're in, even lukewarm. But as we become more determined to do his will, we love him in return. We become warm human beings. When we make an effort to obey his word, we run into temptations or tests. The Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The Lord seems to reprove our false ideas of happiness and self-satisfaction. He seems to punish our bad habits and attitudes. Now, in fact, these hard states are brought on by the hells, while the Lord turns them to good, helping us to grow stronger spiritually. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Keep trying, and you'll win. All the spiritually weak, wishy-washy aspects of your character will be replaced with strengths. The Lord is always knocking at the door of our minds, preserving our freedom of choice while urging us to let him come in. We hear his voice in his word. And now in the heavenly doctrine, we can hear his voice much more clearly than ever before. We open the door to him as we obey what we have learned from the word. Then the Lord comes in to have supper with us and we with him. He comes to us as his dear friends with whom he sees eye to eye on everything important. Let's take full advantage of the word in the scriptures and in the doctrine so that we may open our doors to the Lord. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and have supper with him and he with me. Amen. Now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. <laughs> o Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful and true witness, we are grateful for the revelation of the spiritual sense of the word. For when we read it reverently, thou dost make thy second coming to us. Strengthen our resolve to read the word that we may draw nearer to thee. Open our eyes to the truths which should constitute our faith and life. Give us the strength to obey the commandments of the word with zeal and actual repentance. Then we will receive spirit and life through thy word, and thou wilt come into us and have supper with us, and we with thee. Amen. Yes, I come quickly. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.